All right. Welcome to another episode of The Path to You. Today we are joined by Alicia, the Dance Dragon Slayer. I am so excited to have you on today. I just love your energy and I love who you are and, and what you represent. So um, as we start with every episode, how did you get here? Oh, first I want to say thank you for having me, Leilani. And you know, you're my soul sister from another mister. Yep. <laughs> You've taken my classes many times, and um, I appreciate your energy and your support always. So I just want to start by saying that. Thank you. Um, how I got here, and here as in my current life in California, as a married mom of two, having a full-time dance career, when I did not think that would be possible. So I just want to say what I am considering here. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I will quickly go back to my roots, but I'll try my best to be concise in how um, I got to this point. Uh, I was not one of those children that was dancing out of the womb. I wouldn't say that that was me. Um, I wasn't described that way. Uh, but my mom took me to see Swan Lake when I was about four years old. So there must have been some kind of inkling that um, she knew that I would enjoy that because that's not a typical event that you would take a four-year-old to, right? I have, <laughs> I have a six-year-old son and an eight-year-old son. And, and trust me, like buying tickets to Disney on ice is a risk, okay? So, <laughs> so my mom must have known that I would enjoy it. And I did. And um, according to her account, she said, as soon as the ballerina stepped on stage, I just gasped and went, <gasps> and, and then I just fell in love. So I'm, you know, that's, that's her perspective. I can't, you know, um, negate that. But I do remember just being in love with ballet. And I wanted to take classes. And I begged my mom. It's like, you know, put me in classes. And, you know, she put me in like tap classes at first, which was great. But it wasn't quite what I saw. And it didn't, you know, it didn't um, ignite my heart like ballet did at first. Um, and so I didn't seriously start my training until like I was about seven years old. And, you know, at the same time, I'm, I'm, from you know Bronx, New York, and I have two older brothers, and at the same time, um, hip hop is just taking off in my neighborhood, like in in my city. So, it, Bronx, the Bronx being the birthplace of hip hop, and um, it was just something that we had to intentionally participate in because it wasn't mainstream, mm. and so um, hip hop music was shared only by very few channels. It was like a local, you know. Um, a local uh, video channel and uh, the radio only played it at certain times of the day and you know you had to go to specific places to participate e either in listening or dancing to it and stuff like that at that time by the way i'm 39 almost 40 so that <laughs> uh so yeah so it was kind of like really it was at the beginning of, of hip-hop and so it was like a big part of um my life because you know my older brothers were like in in that that um wave right they were in that wave and they were like bringing it into the household and so i always had a love for hip-hop and and hip-hop dance and my family's from the caribbean so caribbean music was always there um at family functions and um and dancing and um caribbean dancing was just a part of my life as well not just in my own family but the area was um that i grew up in was also uh, uh, largely populated by uh, Caribbean immigrants from all over, uh, but mainly Jamaican. Um, my family's from Dominica and Antigua. So those are just the, like the early dance influences I had, ballet, hip hop, and Caribbean. And that's just kind of what fueled me in the studio with more of the ballet side and then out of the studio with the Caribbean and, and um, hip hop dance. And so um, I went to a local dance school that was, you know, like a mom and pop family type of, of thing. And um, my dance teachers were, they, they knew all of us and they were very personal. It was more like a family. And so I just had that really nurturing introduction to, to dance. Um, and I was able to develop some really great skills, you know, good enough to earn scholarships uh, to the Avenelli School of Dance, as well as, um, you know, I, I auditioned for uh, Performance Arts High School, LaGuardia High School for the Performing Arts. So, you know, they prepared me to be a competitive dancer in these, um, in these contexts. 
Um, however, I don't think I was as prepared mentally because I was coming from such an intimate, small environment. And I think that I had relied so much on that positive reinforcement for validation as a dancer. Mm -hmm. So when I was um, in these other dancers that, first of all, were attracting the cream of the crop from all over the city, that was in and of itself, just seeing these amazing dancers, amazing young, talented dancers from all over the city. So that in and of itself can be intimidating. But, you know, throw into the mix the fact that the instructors weren't, I wouldn't say that they weren't warm and supportive. It just wasn't that same family vibe. And because of my interpretation of it, I, I began to create a narrative that I wasn't worthy or I wasn't worthy of their attention, uh, mm. attention or kind words or whatever I equated um, being a good dancer with, right? So I wouldn't say that they were negative teachers. I just think that my early introductions to um, feedback and, and, and what I thought, the, feed, the feedback I thought that um, validated me as a dancer, I wasn't receiving it. And so I thought, well, I must not be a good dancer because I'm not receiving that feedback. Mm. So, uh, so I took that narrative to heart. I, I, I created a truth and, mm. and being led by that false narrative, that false truth, I stopped dancing altogether. Mm. And that, that bridge lasted for 10 years or, or that hiatus lasted for 10 years. And it was a really destructive and toxic narrative that I let redefine me because up until that point, I had no qualms about owning and defining myself as a dancer, however I was in terms of my skill and ability and my potential for growth. Like I, I knew I wasn't the best dancer, but it's okay. It was okay with me. I can still be a dancer, but because I had started to internalize this narrative that didn't come from anyone but me, to be honest, mm. um, uh, I, I thought that I was no longer able to call myself a dancer because a dancer looked the way, um, you know, these other dancers looked or um, dancers received positive feedback and I was no longer receiving that feedback. And um, I was really nervous about letting anyone see my, my, my dancing body. I was ashamed of my dancing body. Mm. I, I thought that if people would see my dancing body, something that was so connected to my identity and judge it to be unworthy, then, then the connection I was making was that I, I as a human was not worthy because right. dance was so much of who I was. Yeah. So I, I, I tried to hide that piece of myself and then overcompensate in other areas to feel worthy within myself. And, um, you know, so I kind of threw myself into academics and you know how, I don't say, I don't say, you know how we do, but sometimes <laughs> relationships, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just anything that I could hold on to, to redefine myself because of the void that, uh, not dancing had created in my heart and, and yeah. dance had been so much of who I was. And Intense. so that last How old you were when that happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was like literally from like 16 to 26. Oh, wow. Okay. So it was a long time. So, so from like 16 to 26 and um, at the age of 26, that was just a time in my life where I, I don't even know what the catalyst was. I, I think that um, at, at that time I was working as a school counselor. So I, you know, completed college. I had completed my first uh, master's degree in school counseling and I was working as a school counselor. And you know what, you know what it was? I, I started thinking, well, what if dance was melded with mental health? And I thought I did, I thought I invented dance therapy. <laughs> <laughs> what if you could put these two? <laughs> not realizing like, right, it was a whole field of study, but I started, you know, kind of Googling it. And then I realized it was a field of study and I'm like, oh, so that was really eye opening for me. Um, not to downplay the effectiveness of dance therapy, um, but I, I kind of held onto it because it was safer for me to say, well, you know what? I'm a therapist just kind of using dance. I'm not really a dancer, right? Mm -hmm. So I was at that point, 
I, I felt like I needed to bring it back into my life because the, the void was just too um, painful, for lack of better words, yeah. you know, being away from dance that long. So I was, I'm, I'm proud of myself at that time for recognizing that dance was a medicine that my spirit needed. Yeah. Um, but at that point, I still wasn't able to fully claim just dance in and of itself. I had to kind of cloak it with mental health because if I was to just own dancer just by itself, it, it was too loaded for me. I didn't feel mm. at that time worthy. So I was like, well, I can be a dance therapist because I'm not really a dancer. I'm just a therapist using dance. Yeah. So, um, so I started um, studying that as a part of my research for my, my master's thesis. So I was still in grad school. So I was, I was researching it for my master's thesis and I started you know, learning about it. At the same time, that was kind of when the advent of Zumba was coming about, right? Oh, so this is like 2007, yeah. right? So Zumba kind of was just kind of getting legs and, but people still didn't really know what it was. And I was um, taking a class at you know, my local gym and my Zumba instructor was just amazing. You know, she, um, she was a, a black woman and she was playing all this like amazing, like Afro Latin music, but then she would um, play, she would play uh, not hip hop. I don't even know what it was. Maybe it, was, it wasn't Afro beats cause that wasn't the thing at the time, but she would play like whatever Afro pop was at the time and put in, mix in all these like traditional West African movements. It was just like, it was just so fun. Everybody in the space was like having fun, including myself and, um, I wasn't thinking about whether I was good or not. I was just like having fun. And so what I learned and, you know, I'll see, I told you I could be loquacious. <laughs> I told you. Let me fast forward. But, um, but what I learned from that class, which I implement in my diaspora dance and dance dragon sling programs is like the more you are able to drop into flow and freedom, the better your skills will be. A lot of dancers want to increase their skills and then let that be a tool to drop into flow and freedom. And I, mm. and I personally have experience for myself and seen that it's just the opposite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's what happened with me. I was taking these Zumba classes and, and, and not caring about the product, but enjoying the process. And in turn, the skills that I was um, uh, trying to hide were shining through mm. and so the instructor um became pregnant and she asked me if i could take over the class i was like what <laughs> you know, I was like what what are you talking about she's like yeah just you should teach my class you should totally teach i first of all i had no idea that she was like looking at me like that or that you know she i felt so honored and and shocked and humbled that she looked at me like that she was like oh i totally thought you had like a degree in dance and you know you know after all of these years of not dancing for 10 years and yeah, to have yeah. someone like that look at me and think of me as someone highly skilled was just like mind blowing. And so it was, it was really um, kind of the shot in the arm that I needed, that, that shot in the arm of self-belief. And so she told me how to get you know, certified at that time. And I started taking over a class and that, that began my journey of uh, you know, being a dance instructor, just teaching Zumba at first. So I'm really grateful for Zumba. They, they, you know, people can say what they want about Zumba commodifying culture, but what Zumba has done is create a platform and a space that is accessible for all levels of dancers. And um, everyone wants to dance. Every, <laughs> I don't want to say everyone, but many, many, many people on this earth have an urge to move their bodies to music. And Zumba has allowed that for many people. And so I think Zumba is great. Yeah. And I, I think yeah. you're right in the, in the sense that everybody wants to dance. When you hear music, and maybe it's not the same music for everyone, but yeah, your body wants to move. Like I think Twitch had said body or dance is the language of music. Yeah. So it's true. So, yeah. I always say, I mean, even when people I can tell when people have dance dragons when they're like, I don't dance. <laughs> when, they mm. answer, <laughs> when they answer like that, I don't dance. Like that, I'm like, okay. I can just <laughs> tell that there's already, right? There's like yeah. that wall or that block. But you know, if you even look at like cells and you apply sound frequencies to cells, they'll start moving and responding to it. Mm -hmm. And so 
you even when you're not dancing, your body is still dancing inside on a cellular level when you hear music. So mm -hmm. whether you want to make Huh? Plants do too. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, whether you want to include your limbs <laughs> and your hips, <laughs> that's up to you. But yeah. whether you like it or not, your body's dancing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so when I started studying dance therapy, that um opened the door for me to pursue uh, more education in expressive arts therapy because I really liked the idea. I liked how inclusive it was, right? So that was what was drawing me now, like, oh, this is really inclusive and this is really healing. Whereas in my earlier training, the idea was about creating aesthetic, you know, because mm -hmm. I was, mm -hmm. I was like on a pre-professional track and it was about aesthetic and it was about um, technique and mastering your body to, to recreate you know, shapes and things like that. I, I feel like if I had continued my training like more into my senior year in college, I would have gotten to the point where um, my training would have taught me more about storytelling and energy like that. But because I had stopped at like 15 and 16, it was still in the more laying the foundations of technique. So I feel like my um, ability to tell a story kind of was stunted in that area. And I, even, even to this day, I feel like that's my challenge. I'm more about creating the process because that's just kind of, <laughs> that's just kind of where I was and, and what I care about now. But mm -hmm. so I moved to California to pursue um, another degree specifically in um, expressive arts therapy because my first degree was school counseling. And, and that's where I met my husband. I met him <laughs> Oh. I, met him, I met him in grad school he was you know working on his uh doctorate for um psychology to be a licensed psychologist which is what um he is today and while i um was working on my degree i, I started teaching zumba here on the west coast and creating a community and so dance has been not just a way for me to tap into owning my dopeness or owning my identity as a, as a dancer, but it's also been like a huge way that I've connected to other people mm -hmm. here. And um, yeah, so we got married and had kids. <laughs> and that, you know, and after, and I kind of, and I, like I said, I appreciate Zumba so much to this day. I still am inspired by Zumba as not just for what they do for people in terms of creating opportunities and space, but also how they have uh, evolved as a business mm -hmm. and, um, you know, a, a self-sustaining business that's not reliant on any one person. And so when I started having my own, when I started developing my own language and ideas about how to create a like signature experience, um, that's when I started formulating and manifesting diaspora dance which is my personal dance brand so i was teaching other branded formats and i started thinking about well if i had my own branded format what would it entail what would be the experience that i want students to have what ideals um what are my ideals that can be um embodied in that signature experience. Mm -hmm. And um, so I thought about it. I really thought about what was important to me. What's really important to me as a dancer, right? Is it, is it technique? Is it, um, you know, cu cultural purity? You know, is it purity as in like, you know, teaching a class in such a way that like I'm delving into the cultural components of it? Is it, um, you know, what is it? So I had to think about that. And I came up with diaspora dance and diaspora meaning my music and my movements are inspired by uh, culture, cultures from across the African diaspora. Mm. And so originally my playlist had a little bit of everything. It had like dancehall and soca and Afro beats and um, it had samba, it had hip hop, it had all, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> to just be you know extremely inclusive um but then over time because this is about the third year that i'm doing it and then over time it kind of whittled down to the stuff that floats in my boat the most <laughs> and um because i feel like what makes me feel most passionate will shine through and allow the students to um tap into that energy and fun as well mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And so my playlist consists mainly of Afro beats and soca because those are my favorite genres. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But in regards to the experience and the values that um, my particular class upholds are um, inclusive, inclusive space for um, all backgrounds and genders. Um, and I have to be specific about that because I used to teach at an all women's studio. So I, <laughs> <laughs> um, all, all genders and, you know, self-identified identities. I don't know if I said that correctly, but any, however you identify, you can come, okay? You can come here. <laughs> Whatever Just you want to call dance. yourself. Just come okay. dance. <laughs> yes. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but <laughs> maybe I should get some <laughs> clear verbiage. I'm sure somebody but, will, uh, will correct you if right. necessary. <laughs> um, so it is, um, culturally inspired and it, it's a space for beginners and advanced beginners to push and challenge in a non-judgmental supporting space. So it's not an absolute beginner's class. It's a space where if beginners want to go to the next level, they can come and try this experience because it's going to push you. But a lot of times people stay in the beginner stage because when they go to more advanced classes it's, it's just super intimidating because because <laughs> advanced classes attract advanced dancers and you're like what the hell <laughs> so i i love Even you know I, I, intermediate classes like yeah intimidate me right so i you know so i think about like where i was returning to dance right after 10 years i wasn't a beginner but i wasn't ready for intermediate or advanced classes but I was, I definitely had like a fragile <laughs> mindset, you know, because of yeah. all the stuff that I was still coping with. And so, um, so I think about those dancers and there's so many of those dancers out there. So th that's what my class, that's who my class is for. Mm. And so that's what I build my coaching programs around too. It's like the everyday dancer that wants to own the dancer within themselves, but are struggling with dance dragons. And so what are the tools and strategies I can provide for you to eliminate those dance dragons. So you can use dance however you want to, whether that is create your own projects, be a dance leader, or just so that you can enjoy pushing yourself and growing as a dancer um, in classes or in trainings just for yourself. So that's how I got here <laughs> as a dance inspiration coach nice. and as a dance teacher. <laughs> Perfect. So I, I want to know how and when did you coin the term dance dragon? Oh, yeah, that was, I would say, when did I start saying that? Um, so I'm, I want to say maybe about in t about t 2017, maybe 2016 or 2017, I started using that because I'm trying to think about like when I started making like my first social media posts about it. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe around that time, uh, because right at this point, I was aware that my negative self-talk had been stemming from a narrative. Mm -hmm. So I knew that and, I, and um, I had become empowered by that awareness because then I realized that I can change my own narrative. So I was very empowered by that. And so um, when I realized that, I started um, calling the voices demons i called them dance demons at first mm. because um their energy i felt tormented by it right because when i in hindsight when i looked at my journey it was kind of like a, a tormenting that was keeping me away from myself my authentic self um but then i felt like the energy was too the demon that energy was too um harmful and it it, it didn't quite fit even though I felt tormented, I knew that the, the voices in my head were trying to protect me from, go, from dancing because then if I were to dance, that would then trigger all these feelings of doubt and shame. Okay. So the, the voices were saying, girl, you better not dance because if you do, you're gonna you know, be embarrassed and I love you too much for you to go out there and embarrass yourself, right? right. So not very, not the most constructive form of protection, but still it wasn't an energy that was trying to hurt me. It really was trying to protect me. And so that's why I called it a dragon because mm -hmm. the whole idea is that a dragon, 
um, uses fire to protect the treasure, right? If you want to use that kind of like folklore, the sure. other, you know, it's trying to protect using fire to protect the, these jewels or this treasure. So um, I thought that that was more fitting. And so once I started looking at the dragons uh, for what they were doing, then they were more workable. It wasn't me struggling to eliminate them. It was just saying, I understand, I have compassion, but let's try another way. Let's try these constructive ways. Let's try um, something where we both achieve the same aim of uh, protecting and uplifting me, but not by keeping me away from dance. So that's how I came up with the coin dragon, dance dragon. Okay, okay. cool. And then how did you, I mean, I feel like, I don't remember when I met you. It's got to be a few years now, but. Yeah, it has been. I feel like you have evolved so quickly with what you've been offering and what you've been putting out there. Like, how has it, how has it become in such an alignment for you? Like all the things that you are offering now, the dance coaching, the um, diaspora dance, like how did all of these things come into fruition for you? Um, thank you, by the way. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still a work in progress and still thinking of different mediums and ways to produce the same outcome of making people feel most empowered with their authentic selves as dancers. Um, I think initially the first step was creating my diaspora dance, dance experience. So I had the idea of dance dragon and 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 using that as an instructor like how can i create my classroom space even though i was working in another studio how can i create this class experience so that people feel like they can slay their dance dragons with me and and so i just started talking about it i just started naming it like i would just begin my classes like hey this is what we're going to do by the way i know the dance dragons are hanging up there in the rafters what are dance dragons? There are these things. So they're going to pop up. But you know what? We're going to do this, that, and the third when we're dancing, right? So I just think that even just naming that in the space of my classes helped dancers feel like, <sighs> because one thing that I noticed is that a lot of dancers feel like they're the only ones that have dance dragons. <laughs> they feel alone. It's really isolating to think that everybody in the class has got it together and got it going on, and you're the only one that's struggling on the inside. Where in reality, a majority of the students have some some kind of negative self-talk going on, right? And so I just started just kind of naming it in the space. And um, and I started to feel like, well, how can I how can I just focus on that alone? How can I just focus on the inner process alone? And so I created like a like a two-hour workshop. And so I piloted a workshop that it was confusing to some people because it was a dance workshop, but there was very little dancing. Mm. <laughs> right it was like let's delve within and some people were like well, I don't I don't get it how come we're not not dancing I'm like because you need to think about what's going <laughs> you need to look at your story you need to do all these different yeah. inner you know inner work um and then so I so I started like um let me think oh sorry I'm sorry just kind of going back into the recesses of my mind so I started coming across different like you know, social media like reads your mind. So all these like ads started coming through. <laughs> like they are listening, the series listening. Yeah. So I started getting like all of these like ads about like be this bomb coach, be this, you know, learn how to do this, that, and the third. And one that kept coming coming across and really resonating with me was Danielle Leslie. Now I don't oh, know if you're yeah. familiar with it. Yeah. Oh, like every 10 minutes, like Danielle Leslie's posts were coming to me. Like, you know, create your your course from scratch, blah, blah, blah. And so um, my husband gifted me Aww. her online course. It like, it like touched my heart. So he had already had a successful online course where he was training um, other therapists. Oh, wow. And so I, like, I want to do something like that too, but I had like no idea like how to begin to even like take my ideas and create a system. Like I didn't know how to do that. And so he gifted me course from scratch. And then when I did that, that helped me turn my ideas and this workshop that I created into like a program. And so that's how um, my dance inspiration coaching 
um, my individual sessions are laid out. And then when I do group sessions, they're laid out because I was able to create a program using the, the framework that she described. Um, so that's how that came about. Cool. Yeah. And then you also work with middle school kids um, and teach dance with them. And so we were talking earlier that it's a different, I don't want to say the word is beast, but it's a different task. I think that's a <laughs> Right. In working right. with middle school kids and versus working with adults. And I, it's when you're talking about like people who say, no, I don't dance. And you know, yeah. that they really do love to dance, but they're so nervous about expressing themselves. Or maybe they were told that they can't. I feel like that is a big thing with middle school kids that they don't want to dance yeah. in front of each other because they don't want to get made fun of. And it's that growth stage. Yeah. And so you feel awkward. Um, how do you approach it with them versus when you approach it with an adult or is it the same in some capacity it's a lot of it i would i would say a lot of it is the same and now so this is my second year as a middle school teacher and everything just kind of like aligned because prior to that i was teaching in various schools various preschools i had um, a lot of different um adult oriented dance events and offerings and um, you know, just piecing my income together like that, because one thing uh, that I also learned over the years is that I am a dancer and I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to do anything else. And that felt really good to know that. <laughs> and I know that I, I'm in a, in a place of a privilege because I know that there are other individuals who, if they had it their way, all they would do is perform and teach um, but because of, you know, having to pay rent and the realities of having real world adult expenses that, you know, sometimes the arts, not just dance, but the arts in general just doesn't uh, allow that. And so, you know, I was working hard to piece together my income in, from so many different streams. And that's also one of the reasons why I wanted to do um, a program and an online program, because I wanted to provide something that um, would provide passive income. and. I'm glad I, ha I was in that mindset already before the pandemic because I had already kind of built an idea. I didn't have to you know, create anything from scratch. I had already a, a program that existed with an online forum. Um, and so I'm, I'm doing distance teaching with these uh, middle schoolers and it came right on time last year because then my, my youngest son was in kindergarten and my oldest son you know, was in the second grade. And so finally I had free childcare. <laughs> And I could go back to work full time. Yeah. And, um, and it came about because one of the um, administrators was a, a student of mine. So, oh. <laughs> so you see what I mean about like dance, just creating co community and, um, you know, connection. I, we talked about that off, off camera, off microphone. <laughs> Offline. <laughs> Offline. <laughs> um, so she approached me about it and, and it, it was in alignment because I had the school counseling credentials and background and I had the dance background and whoo last year was just a learning experience it was so hard in the beginning of the year and you know while I was in it it just looked like these students were just kicking my butt and I'm like I I, I had to make I had to learn the distinction between teaching dance student youth, which I had done before. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to say average, but just youth that I love dance, but didn't have a studio experience. Right. And they were not enculturated to the studio experience. And I didn't understand how to connect with students that did not have the studio experience. Mm -hmm. And the way I was teaching just was not landing for them because there wasn't a mutual respect so I was feeling like, oh my God, these kids don't respect me at all. They don't, they, you know, I was like on a high horse. Like they're so ignorant about the, the, the process and they don't understand that when you do these drills, it's to do the, like they don't care. They didn't care about any of that. And at the yeah. same time, you know, so the, this is where I'm from and from this like high horse position, but I was not respecting what they cared about as dancers, right? Mm. If I, if my philosophy is like everybody is a dancer and I'm coming in as a dance teacher and not really taking my time to get to know, well, what does dance mean to you? 
how does dance look for you? Yeah. And I'm yeah. over there trying to teach them my way and like, yeah, making space for them and giving them a chance to, um, giving them a chance to create their own dances, but not doing my due diligence to create a community where there was a mutual understanding, trust and knowing. So it was like, you know what? We're connected in some way. So try a little bit of my way and I'll try a little bit of your way. And, and in that way, they were like, yeah, Alicia, teacher Alicia, they call me teacher Alicia. I, I may not be feeling what you're showing me, but you know, you cool, so I'm gonna give it a try. So there was none of that, right? Mm -hmm. Because I didn't lay the, found, the groundwork for this human connection, this community connection, and it just like blew up in my face because I'd never had to. I had always been teaching experienced dancers. And I didn't even know what TikTok was. I'm like, what is this TikTok? <laughs> I didn't know what TikTok was. And I'm like, TikTok is so annoying. All they wanna do is TikTok dances. <laughs> And they're just doing, they're not even making up their own stuff. They're just doing the same thing that everybody else did. Yeah. You know, it was just like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but this year, this year, so I, I learned a lot though. I was like, I had to humble myself. You know, it was, it, it wasn't, I'm the adult and I am, you know, the one that's creating, in, in charge of creating the culture of the class. And so I had to humble myself and think about like, how can I backtrack and create, just like I did with diaspora dance with willing adults, how do I connect and create with youth that have their own idea of what dance is and also have all these like hangups about dance dragons and stuff like that because everyone's self-conscious in middle school. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I think my approach with them that is different from adults is that there's just a lot more in attention to creating a trust. I feel like adults just come, they voluntarily come to, voluntarily, excuse me, voluntarily come to me and trust that I'll facilitate an experience that'll be beneficial to them. The students, yes, they do opt into the class, but there's a lot of mistrust at first, or not necessarily mistrust, but like a, a wait and see kind of energy. Because they're like, I don't give a damn that you went to Ailey. Like, what is Ailey? I don't know what that right. is. Like, <laughs> My credentials mean nothing. My credentials yeah. mean nothing to them. And what's going to mean something to them? Me and how I treat them and my relationship with them. And so that I feel like um, is the main thing, the relationship. And, and that, that's helping me with my adults now too, because even though it's a lot easier with adults, I'm now seeing that like I'm creating relationships because online teaching, like you have to come through the screen. <laughs> You mm -hmm. can't just be like, and one, and two, and three. You have to create some kind of relationship that they feel motivated to, like, find some kind of juju and energy in their living room while I'm not there. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that's the biggest difference. Like, you better pay attention to those human beings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You better pay attention. <laughs> yeah, especially that age, because if you don't hook them, they're gone. Ugh, so true. And I'm, I'm so grateful that I've, you know, now in my second year that there were a lot, I have a lot of returning students, even some students that I, I swore up and down hated my guts, <laughs> like underneath it all. They were like, yeah, that was fun. I'm like, really? It was. <laughs> like, you know, but the, it's the defense. It's the defense. Yeah. They can't, they can't show that they're having fun. It's right. cool to be like, <laughs> right. Oh, I'm like, angst. Right, right. They can't show yeah. that, but then they're like, you know, especially when uh, Shelter in Place first took place, and you know, we were still connecting. Them. They're like, I miss you, Teacher Alicia. I'm like, and you know, I, I'm like, I miss you too. But in my mind, I'm like, you do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good to know. But you know, I every every day I was hopeful. Every day I was like, we are going to start from scratch every single day. That's how I approached it. We will start from the beginning. I would give everyone a chance every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's life too, right? Like every day you have to wake up. It's a brand new day. It's a brand new person. Yeah. Yeah. Give it a chance. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's going well too. It's going well. It's exhausting. Yeah. I'm online all day. Yeah. I'm so tired. <laughs> how many kids do you have? Um, so the way they're doing it to accommodate online learning is, um, 
they're, they're cutting it into mini semesters. So now each quarter is only eight weeks. And then I'll have another cohort for eight weeks. And then in the spring, I'll have my initial quarter and I'll teach them the second half of my curriculum and then it will switch again. So I'm gonna have uh, uh, four switches. I'm gonna have four, four groups throughout the year. Okay. Um, and that's so they won't be bogged down. So, so they have three classes a day. Can you imagine if they had six classes a day? Like it would, it just wouldn't be possible. So no. they're doing it to make it manageable yeah. to their humanity. Yeah. <laughs> So each student has three classes a day and that for eight weeks and then they'll switch and then take their other three classes and then okay. like that. That's um, so current, yeah. So it's, it's, it's digestible. It's still hard because I'm also supporting my kids that are doing their own, you know. Right. Learning. But um, so right now with this, with this quarter system, I have 50 students that I see in amongst three uh, classes a day. And then um, I don't know how much I'll, I don't know how many I'll have in the next quarter. I'll see when they switch over the rosters. But okay. last year I had about 96, 96 in total. Wow. Yeah. A lot of personalities. Yeah. A lot of personalities. I love, yeah. I love that I have a lot of English language learners too that oh, cool. have no idea what I'm saying, but then I'm like trying to practice my Spanish, my directions in Spanish and just yeah. kind of like connect with energy. Like, just saying their names and like coming into the camera, <laughs> you know, just, just trying to be energetic, energetically welcome because I don't speak, you know, the language, their yeah. language. Um, yeah. Have you heard of a uh, Duolingo? I have, I need to get on it. I need to, I used to be so lazy in my high school Spanish classes and now I'm kicking myself in the butt, like <laughs> so ignorant and not taking advantage. But yeah, I'm learning. I know, I know. Derecha, izquierda, derecha. There you go. That's all you need to dance. Uno, dos. Yeah. Mano. Yep. Yeah. Mano para arriba. Mano para abajo. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm Good. sure they're super grateful to have you, even if they don't realize it in this moment. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, or like you I said. Have, I go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, that you might not even realize that they're super grateful until at the end, and and they tell you, and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> and <you're getting laughs> back to it. Yeah, it's a trip. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit and talk about that first class you took after being 10 years off of not dancing. I think I read it on your website that you took a class and basically like you felt like you bombed. You went to the instructor, was like, uh, oh my God, it was my first time. And there was just no love. Yeah. I think that just kind of speaks to a lot of the dance culture that we have seen, whether it's I, I remember I hated ballet growing up because it was mm. so militant and rigorous and just was not fun. Yeah. I'm not saying that everything has to be fun, but it just felt like a drill sergeant. And yeah. I didn't know how you could cultivate someone to want to be a ballet dancer with that kind of energy. Um, yeah. And with, I think, sometimes in hip-hop you can see people get really clicky and and there's like I don't know I just think that there is this maybe river of toxicity that <laughs> travels through different dance groups or dance culture um but I don't I, I do think like with what you're doing is changing that and so how what was your experience like that when you took that class and then how do you think it's evolving since then yeah, that was rough. That was rough. I took a class. I took a, a beginner ballet class. I believe it was a beginner ballet class. And um, I cried. I cried. <laughs> I cried in the beginning of the class. And, and it was just emotional, first of all, to be in the space and yeah. just knowing that I had made this decision to take a class. So I, I cried um, from nervousness and excitement at first. And um, <laughs> You know, I was happy to be back and I was also very nervous because I, I had no idea of what I would remember. Even to this day, like now that I've taken a few ballet classes, 
you know, since then over the years, I, I have forgotten so much terminology. Like it blows my mind how like when I like at the height of my training as a teen, how much terminology I knew. I like my brain just let all of that stuff go. Just like the, the names of the arms and the names of the directions and each of the, oh, it was just, it was a lot. Yeah. But um, I just forgot. I just forgot a lot. I forgot where my body was to, supposed to be in certain places. And, um, but I think at that time, I knew I was going to make mistakes. I think because I had gone, I had gone in knowing that I wasn't going to be perfect. It didn't feel as threatening when the mistakes were made. However, I still felt the need to explain myself <laughs> to the instructor because I just looked like a hot mess, right? So it wasn't so much of a big deal for me, but I did still feel that pressure because, um, right, I felt embarrassed. I mean, there was still like that sense of like embarrassment, but I was working through it. But the instructor was like, mm, like, you know, his energy, he didn't say this, but his energy was like, mm, I could tell, like, mm, you, <laughs> like, yes, you were, you were not it, girl. <laughs> and, um, you know, that wasn't the only class I had taken in that studio. And it was just, you know, I had taken like a hip hop class. I was lost in that hip hop class. Like, oh my God, I was like so lost in a hip hop class. But, you know, the instructor in that space was also, I, I wouldn't say that she was mean or anything like that. She just kind of, I just was, I could have been there or not there. That's how it was. I was just right. like, you know, like you, you can tell like she had a relationship with maybe some regulars and stuff like that. But as someone that had come to the class for the first time, I could, I could have easily have not have been there because it wasn't, there was no like welcome. There was no like my name is, it was, there was just like no personalized acknowledgement that I was there in, in, yeah. in the space, you know, it, the energy was just kind of like you in my space, you know, like she's a teacher and mm. I was in her space. It wasn't yeah. like, this is a space for you. And I think that informs my teaching the most. It's like, even like when um, students, I, you know, are challenged in my class, I'm just like, well, you know, I'm teaching these moves, but if you feel like you want to do it your own way or, you know, I'm like, hey, I'm here to serve you, right? You pay for this class. I'm here to serve you. Ask your questions. Or, you know, just use me as a reference. Like, if this part of the dance makes you want to do a two-step, do a two-step, you know? And just kind of giving folks the permission to, to, to do that, either to make mistakes, to get support, or um, permission to just kind of be uh, authentically and creatively expressed outside of what's going on with the class. You know, so, I mean, I get that certain classes may not be that, like there's certain classes where like you're there to learn from that instructor because mm. it's like, you better get on board <laughs> if you want to <laughs> show up, you know, or you're supposed to be le like, you're supposed to be doing like technique, right? You're supposed to be working on technique. So I get that certain context call for you to follow the formula that's laid out for you because of that specific goal. Mm -hmm. But my class, my the goal of my class is for you to grow in your own way and have fun. So why do I need to be militant? Like why, yeah. you know, this, this is not. And then, so like I said before, you know, maybe if I had an experience like what you just described, I might have had a different attitude too. But the dance school that I had gone to in the beginning was so family-like. Right. And so intimate. And everybody, and in addition to that, everybody was Black. You know, I've, I've heard instances of other dancers that had been curious about ballet, but you know, at that time, there were no studios that had black teachers or other black dancers and things like that. Like everybody was black in my dance studio and um, everybody was kind and you knew everyone else. And so I was able to explore ballet as myself. And like, <laughs> just as Alicia, as a brown girl from the Bronx. So. Um, and I think that's what I would like people to feel in my classes. And so I think my advice for other dancers that may want to try other contexts that are a little bit more formulated and militant, I guess, um, for lack of a better word. Um, but I wouldn't say militant, but just like the intention. Structured. Is to, yeah, structured. Yeah. And, and maybe the intention of the teacher is to impart on you specific techniques for this specific outcome, right? It's very specific. 
and some teachers just don't have time for the other crap. Like that, that's just how they feel. I don't have time yeah. for you, your feelings or whatever crap you want to bring into here because it's about this technique, right? I, I don't do well. I don't thrive in those situations, but some people do and some mm. people want to learn. So my advice for you, if you want to take a class like that, is to create, is to know that when you get those vibes from that teacher, it is not personal. It is not personal. And that's what, the, that's what happened with me in the beginning, right? When the teachers were not responding to me the way I had been used to, I took it very personally. Mm. They're not responding to me because I am not good or whatever you know, narrative I was telling myself it is not personal if you have it even if you have a teacher that i wouldn't recommend going to a class where a teacher is intentionally debasing you because those teachers do exist but if it's just a teacher that's just kind of like what i experienced in the other studio where i could have easily have not been there it is not personal that teacher is kind of in their own space and you as um an empowered dancer have to decide what am I going to take away from this experience? And so that's where your own individual goals come into play. What am I going to, what are my goals right now? I am not going to get some support maybe that I want from the teacher, but I know that there's value. What can I work on? How much uh, choreography can I retain? What percentage do I want to conquer today? What, how do I want to funnel my energy? How can I increase my lines or, so, you know, whatever small micro goals you can um, set for yourself. Think of it that way and just don't take the teacher's energy, attitude, or lack of connection personal. They're there to do their job in the best way they think um, they think is best. And you're there for the purpose of gleaning what it is that you need as an adult empowered dancer that is securing your self-worth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And if that doesn't work, person. then just look for teachers like me that would just love up on you all the time. So that, that works too. <laughs> There's a lot of us there too. There's a lot of mama yeah. bear teachers out there too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a couple more questions if you have time. I do. <laughs> okay. Uh, if someone is, has never taken a dance class before, but they're interested in coming to your class, but they're not quite ready to be the advanced beginner, where would you suggest that they start? What, what would you suggest that they do? I'm, I'm sorry, is this being edited at all? Is this yeah. live? No? <laughs> can it's you please fine. stop knocking? I'm talking. I can edit it if you want. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, wait, this, is social, this is social distancing. My yeah. love, I want to, I want to, you, yes, you may have cookies. We can have cookies. Okay, Yes, hi, yes, that's my life. Woohoo, cookies. <laughs> cookies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's a very graceful kick. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, the question was, what would I tell a, I'm sorry, repeat the question, please. So if someone has never danced before, but they want to take a dance class, but they're not quite ready to step in front of like a class with you and, and they're not there yet, what would you suggest that they do to prepare? Mm -hmm. um, privates are great. Privates are great. I've definitely had clients that have asked to do a private with me before going to a dance class. Um, and, um, and in those privates, I would dance with them and also all the mindset stuff was like, you know, get your mind ready for a dance class. Right. Um, so right. privates are great. Um, also look for, um, a dance class that is process oriented and not product oriented. So I, I would highly recommend a Zumba class, U jam, you know, something like that. That would yeah. just really, I feel like those classes raise your vibrations tremendously and like just like open you to moving and feeling good while you're moving. So I, I, I highly recommend classes like that. And, you know, there's a bunch of other uh, formats, um, you know, hot hula, all those, all those kinds of classes, those dance fitness classes. Um, another thing that you can do is to bring a friend, bring a friend, take a dance class and bring a friend. Why? Because you want to bring an ally. 
a lot of uh, the insecurities comes from feeling alone and having all of this internal experience and not really an outlet to to let it out. When you bring a friend and say you're struggling, you can say to that friend, "Woo, girl, oh my God, that was so hard. And, you know, and, and be okay, right? And be okay mm -hmm. with being authentic about it. So having an, an ally, I call it like a dance ally or dance buddy with you um, is very helpful. And then one strategy I, I share with my clients is like, make a friend. <laughs> Go to a dance class and you, you, know, you find a spot on the floor and then that person next to you, you make eye contact with them or give them a high five. Like I'm, you know, I'm all for it because even, <laughs> you know me as a person, but some people are like, are new to me. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I'll go to a dance class and, I, and you know, depending on how it is, but you know, if it's like a hip hop class, but then everybody's still like so focused and I'm like, the teacher might say something, you know, or we'll do a pass and I'm like, woo, and I'll go like that. And then the teacher will be so appreciative because the teacher's mm. like, yes, energy. Yeah. And then next thing you know, the people around me are like getting into it too because everybody's yeah. so used to being like studious, but I'm like, you know that we can like have fun, right? Like, <laughs> you know, yeah. so like, you know, make friends with the people around you. Just, you know, it's that's not for everybody though. Like that's, kind of easier for me but even if you're on the shy side just giving eye contact to the person next to you and having an uh, energetic ally is very helpful as well yeah I do appreciate the high fives that you have us give in class as well as like the dance circles and like all the free time to just dance and just be with each other I think yeah it's really cool. yeah see you just gotta make the connection <laughs> You know, it's actually funny, uh, Chris Rodriguez and I have been on a couple walks since taking that class with you two together, so. Oh, good. Okay, good. <laughs> Community building. <laughs> yeah. Um, if somebody is interested in working with you, but they're not quite sure what to expect from your coaching, what would be some of the things that you, you go through with them? Yeah, so, um, the first thing I'd like to know from my clients is like what, if you can, I always ask this, right? If you can snap your fingers and realize your dance dreams, what would that look like? And how would that change your life, right? How would, how would you be transformed? And um, so I would just have my clients look within and and answer that question and sometimes their their dreams are you know things like oh i want to be a backup dancer for janet jackson and things like that not to say that like that's not a possibility for some of us but you know some of us like in our wildest dreams that's what we want and so i will look at that dream and i'll and i'll ask them like well what does that mean to you like what dance for janet jackson what does that mean oh well i'll get to travel oh, okay well i i get to like feel the audience right so so now i'm breaking it down so like what are the values that dream represents to yeah. you so i help them figure out well then how can you take those values and manifest it in uh, a, a dance role in your life right now right so it's not necessarily about the dream itself it's about the values that the dreams embody and so that's how we set goals right that's how we set goals so what you know what happened to you that created the blockages and how can we um, create strategies to accomplish those goals um, as your most authentic and, and loving, self-loving self? You know what I mean? And so that's, that's what they can expect is like um, kind of taking an inventory of what happened. So not necessarily what's wrong with you, but like what happened to you? And then how can we rewrite our narrative? And then, then we get future oriented. And, and in that way, so how can we take an inventory of your values and create a life so that you are being led by the principles and values that you care for the most and creating your dance around that. So that's, that's pretty much the process of my coaching. Cool. And someone who wants to work with you doesn't have to identify as like a dancer per se. Like maybe they're, they're not a professional dancer. Like they can just be an average. Not at all. Dancer. Right. So that word dancer is so loaded, like people don't want to yeah. call themselves dancers because they feel like it means, right? It means certain things. And so, like I say, everyday movers, I get, I say that title, oh, this is for dancers and everyday movers because that just feels like a safer ti title 
or a, a safer identity, even though in my mind, I'm like, you're a dancer, boo. You got a body, you're dancing. Okay. But I get it, right? I get yeah. how um, loaded and um, triggering that word can be. And so I want people to step into, lead them through a process to step into the, the um, place where they can say, I'm a dancer, right? So that's, that's a part of the work. Like, and so, um, no, you don't have to be, <laughs> you don't have to be a dancer or you don't have to be a professional dancer or a training dancer. If you want to allow dance into your life unencumbered by negative self-talk or unencumbered, unencumbered by blockages, then, um, then I'm the person for you. If you happen to be in a space where you want to create income from that, I'm also the person. Like if you want to create a business or brand, I'm there for that as well. But if you just want to be free, to allow dance to be there for you for spiritual reasons or health reasons or mental reasons or whatever, expression, then I'm there, I'm there for that as well. Cool. And then the last question that I have is, is there any other piece of advice or anything else that you'd want to share with? whoever watches this <laughs> um oh i thought this was like uh <laughs> I, I thought this was a like voice only <laughs> we're being watched <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> super candid uh podcast <laughs> um uh so advice there's so much okay so i think that the first give me a second to think about that yeah so I'm gonna just kind of go into my mind, my dancer's mind from like the beginning of the journey. Okay, so uh, a piece of advice I would give is to look at your dance journey as your own. Compare yourself only to the dancer that you were before, right? So look at, you're at your point A and define your point B from a space of inspiration for what you can be, not necessarily out of fear and running away from who you were at point A, right? Mm -hmm. Your point B is a place of inspiration. And that day, your point B, you look at your point A with gratitude, with mm -hmm. gratitude. So um, yeah, just a, a process of, of loving, loving yourself, patience, hard work, and compassion, right? Like to get from your personal point A to, a, and being inspired towards a point B. Gratitude and inspiration. Love it. <laughs> cool. Well, that's all I have for today. I mean, I have so much more, but we have limited amount of time. <laughs> I'm gonna do part two one day. <laughs> I'm down, I'm down. So um, so thank you for sharing your journey today and for sharing your wisdom and your energy. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you so much. I'm, I'm glad to be here on this video recorded podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. Um, I'm going to start recording. Ta -da.